Good morning. Good morning. I, I don't know how to say good morning in Czech. Does anyone know how to say good morning in Czech? Can you go to the mic, say your name, and then good morning in Czech? I'm sure there's somebody who can say it properly, unlike me, but Dobry den, uh, John Scudder. Great. So this is the uh, always exciting, never dull routing area open meeting. Um, I'm sure all of you are here for that meeting, so I won't even tell you if you're not here for that meeting, go away. Um, I know that probably people are outside in line waiting to come in as well. So um, I'm Alvaro, this is Alia. Deborah is somewhere you probably want to reveal too many confidential information tell you where she is um this is not well hopefully you have all noticed that the note well is slightly different this time and for those of you who are chairs you actually put the new note well in your slides um, we are going to have a discussion about this and some other ipr stuff a little bit later in the um, in the program, so um, we're not going to talk about it right now. There's also, there will always project some other resources and tools, the routing area wiki, the routing area directorate, that we're going to have a report from them as well later, the blue sheets are going around, um, etc. So always we want to ask to please, please, please review documents. The mission of the ITF is to make the internet work better. The tools that we have are documents that we produce for people to go implement, to go deploy, to go operate, to go do whatever they do with the RFCs. And high quality RFCs are important. And this is the job of everyone. The job of the people writing the RFCs, of the working groups themselves, of everyone in the working group, of the chairs, of the shepherds, of the ADs, of everyone else, of the directorate, so please, 
please review documents. Uh, there are more keys in your keyboard than plus and one. Please use them as well. Please give us feedback. If, um, oh, here's Deborah. We're not going to ask her where she was, but you know, you can imagine. Yeah. Um, so, feedback to ADs. If you have feedback, are there things we're doing well? Are there things we're not doing well? Please tell us. If you want to use the open mic time at the end, you can. If you want to talk to us individually, you can as well. Um, if you want to talk to the NOMCOM, for example, uh, you can as well. You know, that's always a good thing. Now the NOMCOM has been given us feedback, even when we are not up for selection, for example. So the last NOMCOM period, um, uh, the NOMCOM collected feedback pretty much for everyone and gave feedback back as well. So that's another way to do it, uh, if you want to do that. Um, the agenda, which I did not put in my slides here, um, but is reflected on the online agenda, is um, this one that I'm going to show as soon that moves somewhere. I have a little duck and other things there. Um, is um, this agenda. So we're going through the administrative stuff, of course. I said Lou is going to talk a little bit about the note well, the new note well. Adrian is going to talk about um, uh, RC6701, what sanctions are available, and uh, why it's really, really important to declare IPR early. And then we're going to go into the lightning round of director reports and um, working group and BOF reports. And then we're going to have enough time at the end to discuss the future of the routing area, the future of the world, anything else you want to discuss then, including, of course, as I said before, feedback to the ADs, to the area, to anything you want. Mm -hmm. So uh, the area hasn't changed much in the last uh, since the last time. We haven't closed any working groups. Um, yeah, we haven't closed any working groups, we haven't created any working groups, and we didn't, in the last period, recharter any working groups. Um, Did you think you were showing slides? Uh, I think I could, yes. Uh, it's not showing here either. I don't know what's happening. So, there we go. Hold on. We also haven't changed the assignments of responsible ADs to any of the working groups. Things have been pretty static, but um, that's not necessarily how we see things going in the longer 18 month plus time. Yeah, so we see many working groups, you know, progressing. There's uh, probably a couple of working groups that in the short term we could uh, close or finish the work. Uh, and we see, you know, working groups are ready maybe for recharter, that we should be talking about that uh, as well. So, you know, the working group in general, I think is progressing. We just haven't done many uh, upward changes. We do have a buff today after lunch that is in the routing area. It's called the ideas buff. Uh, hopefully one of the chairs is here to talk in the lightning round. Um, so we can talk about it there. Um, that's it. So in case you don't know who your ID is, again, this is Aliyah, Deborah, and me, Alvaro. And those are our assignments right now. This, of course, can change, or we can shuffle uh, chairs around, or anything else we feel like. Um, uh, so one of the issues that came up last IETF as a result of some of the work that was happening in NetMod, uh, eagerly anticipated work, I should say. Sorry, this question? Or, oh, okay. So one of the pieces that came up was discussion on how to handle the revised data store uh, or the NetMod, uh, Network Management Data Store Architecture, NMDA which I think is demonstration that I'm not the only one who can't come up with good acronyms, um, how to handle guidance for Yang models going forward. Because on the one hand, we now have a really great uh, planned architecture for how to handle uh, different data stores. And so what this means is things between you know, configuration, being able to see what was written, but not necessarily 
uh, so the intended to be able to see that the operational state is to have what when you go and look at them are actually simpler, much more easy to read Yang models that aren't forced to depend on things like lots of groupings. But that technology also needs netconf and restconf extensions in order to be implementable. And we all know there's an implementable lag, you know, there's an implementation lag. I would like to see the existing IETF models able to get finished and go out, but you know, RFCs are carefully chiseled into stone. And so we had this dilemma of how to handle it. So we decided after quite a lot of discussion that what we would like, what we are recommending is if you're doing a Yang model, it should follow the NMDA structure. And for many models, that works just fine. There's not a need for a distinction between the configuration state and operational state. However, for some models, depending upon what's being modeled, it does matter. And for those, we can have another module in the appendix, which gives the state information so that it's possible to do that until the uh, revised data store work has been fully uh, defined as far as the functionality in, Netmo in NetConf and RESTConf, which is really far along, and in fact before that has a chance to get implemented. So the Yang model should be fully usable with being able to access the information needed. Now the hate should do it, NMDA is something that um, you know, it's a should because this is the IETF and we're all really well aware that each example and use case, you know, each particular model may have some differences and unique reasons. So we're certainly happy to talk about it, but this is the recommendation. Rob Wilton gave a very nice presentation on some of the details of this in RTGWG. And if you haven't tragically seen that, then if you're interested, I would really recommend looking at it. And if you have any questions, um, I guess I'm the AD to hunt. Thanks. Any questions on this or anything else that we've touched on up until now? Did you all have coffee already? I would like to propose that um, we uh, assign someone to bring the AD's coffee for next meeting. Anyone want to volunteer for that? <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. Adrian offered me half of his cup. That's I'm a half uh, last half empty, half full person, so I'm I'm happy about that. At least someone replies. Just all I can ask for these days. Um, okay, so we're going to go into our next topic in the agenda, which is um, Lou talking about um, the new Nodewell. And uh, Lou, we have a clicker here. Hopefully it will work. So I got stuck talking about this in MPLS, and I guess the um, it was interesting enough to end up being asked to do it here. Obviously, I need coffee too, by the way. I should have definitely all gone some. Uh, so we have a new note well. If we look at it, you'll see that it looks a lot like the old one. So what are the significant changes? The, the most significant change on this page is that we are now pointing to RFC 8179 rather than the old RFC. So there's a new document covering IPR disclosures in the IETF. That means there's a new document to be familiar with. The, that document updates a number of um, items in a way that is intended to provide clarification to uh, the disclosure rules based on questions that have arisen since the original document was published. Uh, I did talk to the authors about um, sort of helping educate the folks on the details. They posted a nice blog that tells you, identifies the areas that have been updated, but they don't say what's been updated. The plan for our, is for George uh, who's the uh, lawyer for the IETF, to uh, prepare a detailed presentation on that and actually uh, discuss it in Singapore. I'm not sure where it's going to be presented in Singapore, but if you're really interested in being walked through the details as well as ask questions about the details of uh, 8179, there'll be an opportunity there. But what are the key takeaways? 
number one, there's some clarification on uh, what is a contribution. They've written up, I mentioned that the authors wrote up a, a little blog. One of the things they mentioned there is, is anything that you do to contribute to the process or to provide input to the process that um, we follow here in any of the forums that we provide, that includes rooms like this, our email, our Jabber, um, any electronic media, any personal media, in any of those forums, any contribution, even as something as subtle as a frown in a public forum can be taken as a contribution. So for example, John just contributed by sort of smiling at my comment. Now it turns out I don't have any IPR on this, so it's not a big deal. But if I was talking about a technical idea and he smiled and that was taken by maybe the chairs as support, and he knows of some IPR that's related to this, and the reason he's smiling is, yeah, that's my thing, I'm gonna get it advanced. Um, he just contributed, and he would, under the new rules, be obligated to disclose. So, the document also tries to be pretty explicit, explicit on what do you do if you don't wanna disclose or can't disclose. We've all come into, um, situations, or many of us have come into situations where we know that there are some technology that we personally are patenting, patenting or that the company we work for, or that someone we're working with has a patent on the process, and they don't want to talk about it. What do we do then? That's going to happen. This is clarified in the document. It basically says you can't contribute at all. You can't smile or frown when that discussion has taken place. When that occurred with me personally, I never entered the room that the working group was uh, uh, discussing that idea that I was working on. I didn't subscribe to the mailing list. I occasionally read archives, but in no way did I contribute in that area. That was my personal take on how to deal with the situation. You all should read the document, become familiar with it, and decide what your own personal take is on how to deal with compliance with your IPR disclosure um, responsibilities. One other thing the document does that the previous document did not do is point to RFC 6701, uh, which covers um, sanctions of what can the IETF do when someone doesn't comply with their disclosure responsibilities. Adrian's actually gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, the one thing I wanna talk about, the last thing I wanna mention is what is the responsibility of an IPR holder? So someone who is not a participant in the IETF, but holds IPR, what is their responsibility to the IETF process? Turns out it's nothing. They have no responsibility to disclose their IPR. They have no responsibility to come to the IETF and talk about it. They have no responsibility to say that um, the thing you're doing directly matches my path. We can't compel anyone to do anything who is not involved in our process. What we can do is tell contributors, folks in the room, what their responsibilities are. And then if they don't comply with the responsibilities, take steps based on that. And with that, we're gonna hear from Adrian, who's gonna talk about those steps. Any questions before I run away? Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Adrian. Uh, I'm Adrian. Uh, I have more slides than Lou, but promise to be quicker. Um, given how full the room is, maybe the ADs, if the ADs think this is an important topic, there may be other fora for distributing the information. Um, so, I am not a lawyer. Uh, that's actually quite important for me to say for my own protection and for you to be aware of. Um, and I'm also not studying law. Uh, so, 
this is this is important legal stuff. It affects your life. Um, uh, protect yourself and your employer. <clears throat> your employer probably has uh, somebody um, responsible for all this. Use them, get advice, find out what process you should be following, and use them to file disclosures on your behalf so that um, you can hide behind them while still fulfilling your requirements. So why sanctions? Um, the point is that we want people to disclose. Uh, all disclosures are, are good uh, because they help us understand what we're building and why, um, but late ones can be disruptive. Um, we might have to go back and revisit work, um, but they're still better than no disclosure. Very late disclosures, for example, disclosures that come only after an RFC has been published, uh, can actually be really disruptive. We may have to uh, return stuff to the uh, working group. Um, uh, we may have to um, respin uh, an RFC with completely different uh, mechanisms. Um, but they're still better than no disclosure because still you actually know what IPR is out there. Uh, so what do we do? Well, what does it mean when somebody files a late or a very late uh, disclosure or when they completely fail to disclose? Um, uh, well, firstly, it shows a lack of respect. It shows a lack of respect for um, the ITF, for the people who work here, for the industry, uh, and in my opinion, it shows a lack of respect for the work that an individual is doing. It can be really disruptive. Um, because we've invested a lot of time and energy in a particular solution and now we need to go back and decide whether we do it all again. It may trick us into making a particular protocol choice that we thought we were making like on a toss of a coin, but actually if we'd known about the IPR we'd have gone a different way. Um, it may actually be bad in law, and I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, and just essentially, it's an abuse of the ITF process. By being here, you have signed up to, to follow the ITF process. So what do we do about that? Um, uh, RFC 6701 describes some sanctions that can be applied by the ITF to people who abuse the IPR process. Um, it's pretty clear that the punishment should fit the crime. Okay, so we have so far not had any executions for violation of IPR rules, um, but there have been cases where, where minor things have been done. Um, the decisions and punishments are made by the working group chairs working with their ADs for support. And if you're a working group chair and this sort of thing happens, I strongly advise you talk to the AD straight up so that you've got backing for whatever you do. Um, and you should also talk to the individual concerned because um, they may have a, a legitimate reason why something went wrong and you don't want to punish them too strongly. Well, you might want to. You might enjoy it, but you shouldn't. So what might happen in the ITF? Uh, 6701 has got this long list that ranges from just having a chat to having a chat in public so that everybody knows it's happened. Uh, or even a reprimand, um, uh, some form of name and shame that can actually be really quite powerful. Um, you might move on, especially with the repeat offenders, to say, well, you're not going to actually edit any more working group drafts, or we're not going to accept any drafts that come from you because you've, you've, you've blown it too often. Um, and you might remove somebody from editing position. Uh, you might even deprecate uh, their RFCs. Um, and at the far end of this, people can be banned from mailing lists. Uh, and that starts with a temporary ban, which I think is 30 days from a working group mailing list, and escalates to a year-long ban from a working group list, which can then be picked up automatically by other IETF lists. So it becomes a full IETF one-year ban. And in absolute extreme cases, that can be made into a permanent but revisitable ban from ITF mailing lists. So we can, at the top end of this, say, you just messed us about too often, no more participation. 
Um, there may be mit mitigation, but a lot of mitigation, I think, is, uh, is fragile excuses. So there really is no excuse under the law, and the law is you will declare if you're making a contribution. But, you know, stuff happens, uh, so every situation has to be looked at. Um, unreasonable excuses I have heard, um, I forgot. Oh, you forgot, that's, that's still a violation. I forgot about this patent. Well, whose patent was it? You, you have a duty to remember. I have so many patents, I can't be expected to track them all. Well, actually, you can be expected to track them all. You are expected to. If you believe you've got this problem, that you're so prolific in patents, then stop being prolific in the ITF. You can't have both. Um, nice one. I asked my company to disclose, but they didn't. Well, what you're promising to do when you participate is that a disclosure will happen in a reasonable amount of time. So when that reasonable amount of time expires and your company has still not disclosed, get out. Or file a third-party disclosure against your own company. That's kind of fun. Um, but that happens when you move to a new company. Okay, you, ha you wrote a patent with company X, you're now at company Y. You can't influence company X to disclose that patent, but you know about it. You can either do a third-party disclosure saying, I believe company X may have IPR. That's all you have to say. Or don't participate. Um, and the last point is that courts may also apply sanctions. So this is why your employer really needs to pay attention. Because in the end, patents may come to court, and courts have been known to be quite aggressive when they hear that a standard body's procedures have been violated. They can do things like force um, the, the, the patent holder to license at very cheap terms, or they can even strike down a whole patent, so this patent is no longer valid. Uh, and so your employer probably doesn't want to mess with the courts because they are, the whole point of them having IPR is, is to, to use it profitably. I will also accept questions or coffee. Lou is going to get me coffee. Ah, damn, it's a question. What would you like in your coffee? <laughs> Water, uh, please. Hi, Lou Berger. I realize I forgot to say something. So I'll ask you the question, when am I obligated to disclose uh, when I know that my contribution is covered by uh, my company's IPR or anyone's IPR? I believe that George has used the words as soon as reasonably possible. Um, so this is a good discussion for George. We should ask him. But I think it says before you actually make the contribution or as you're making the contribution. So I think that's interesting, and I think we choose as uh, in the response as chairs to be a little more lenient, but I think the rules say as soon as you are making the contribution, you're supposed to be making the declaration. That's interesting. We may have tightened that up, and certainly... If, exactly. I think this you, is one of the changes. If you, if you observe that and say, I will always disclose before I contribute, then you're safe. Daniele Ceccarelli, suppose I have a patent on, uh, on an area, given area, I don't believe my patent is impacting that work, but the ITF does. Is there a contact point uh, I can check with as a contributor, not, a, not as a chair or... And how can I know <laughs> that the ITF believes there's a... My, my, my API is impacting your work. What, what's really interesting about this is um, that should never occur because the, I, the IEPF should never make a judgment on whether or not IPR applies. That's whether a disclosure has been made or it hasn't been made. That's not for the IEPF to decide. Now, another individual may go look at a patent and do a third-party disclosure on you saying, hey, this, this IPR exists, I found it, and I think it applies. But we won't judge that. It's not the ITF's role to judge the applicability um, of a, uh, a patent. That's court's job. 
So I'm Lou Anderson. I have a question, I think, to Adrian. If we say that, or maybe Lou, I don't know. If we say that we need to disclose as soon as you make a contribution, does that really mean that we should do an IPR poll on every new document that's actually sent to the working group? So this is 6702, which is, um, discusses measures to um, ensure that people are conforming to the, um, the ITR rules. And 6702 is really clear that you do not ever need to do an IPR poll on anything. Okay? So working group chairs are applying 6702 differently depending on how they feel that their working group has been burnt in the past. Some of them don't do IPR polls at all because you will notice that by being named on a draft, you've already made the commitment. Uh, some don't do polls at all because they, the note well, when you sign up, you know, everything, you see the note well, so you've already made the commitment. But others are doing IPR polls at key times just to remind people. So back to your question, should we do an IPR poll every time Lower pulls a face in the room? I suspect, uh, yes, please. I think that would be disruptive to our process. Yeah, that's where I'm going. Uh, one uh, couple additional things. It's the working group chair's call on how the, how that's run today. Uh, there is a question in the Shepherd write-up that asks about has um, uh, I don't remember the exact phrasing, but it is is there IPR and have you asked if there's IPR? So there is some obligation for the Shepherd. It's not on that working group chair actually on the Shepherd to ensure that um, uh, the disclosures that everyone has followed the disclosure process. So how do they ensure that? The only way I know how to do it is by, by asking. It, um, it's actually all, all, only applied to uh, authors and contributors. It's not to the working group members in general. I, I don't believe that's true. That may be how it's... So we just heard from Joel saying that the, the text is as Loa just characterized. I the, the obligation, though, of uh, on IPR disclosure applies to anyone who contributes in in on a particular topic. So if you contribute on a topic, you have that obligation, whether or not you're just sitting in the room or you're the editor, or you're the author. The obligations are the same according to uh, what is it, eighty one seventy nine, whatever the new RFC number is. So in a slightly other subject. Um, when we have, if we actually ban someone from a mailing list uh, because of uh, IP, IPR disclosure violations, we actually stop that person from doing uh, kind of future uh, IPR disclosure. So it's something that is kind of a bit blunt. If we, if we know that uh, that person has more, more than one document in, in the working group, if I ban him, he can't make it as loose on the other. So I just made a contribution there, um, which people who were watching my face will have noticed. Um, that's not the case. Con the disclosures are made by the uh, made through the um, web page for disclosing. So you can do that, and you can obviously you can read any mailing list and see what's going on, so you can be aware. So, hey, of you know, is that true for third-party disclosures also? Uh -huh. Okay, thank. Uh, sorry, before you, you ask your question, um, I just want to say real quick that it is true, yes, we don't have to ask everyone. It has been, I think, a good pra a practice in the area, which I think is a good practice, to remind people whether they have anything to disclose at key moments. Many working groups, where I, it's been my experience, adoption, working group last call, that should be enough to remind people that they need to disclose, right, in case they, whatever happened. So I, I just want to say that, that I think we believe that this is a good practice and something that those of you who are already doing it should continue to do. So, yeah, I know. I actually think it's a good practice for working groups um, to make this call earlier because as it stands today, you can have a standard that could 
very well be an IPR by a company and an implementer. It would be great for implementers to know if there is such a case, then how do they go about um, handling such situations? Um, so a working group would be a right place. Right, and, and, and operationally, uh, I think as to follow on what Alvaro said when he said key moment, there's a tendency to do that at adoption and at last call, and that sort of covers both. So the question is, there's usually a delta about three to 18 months between filing a PR and it appears first time online. So I've witnessed there's possibility after declaring IPR, which is unavailable online. So it's unavailable in general to say, I don't know what your IPR is, but I don't like it. So I want you to document the progress till it's available, which could take any time afterwards. So I think you're alluding to what does a working group do if IPR is disclosed? And whether or not you can read it or not, the process is um, the ITF doesn't discuss the substance of the disclosure whether the, or the validity of it. Now, working group participants are more than welcome to take whatever steps they think are appropriate to then vo to voice an opinion on whether or not they support the work um, that has been covered by an IPR disclosure. Some groups are really want to um, uh, push towards um, sort of open licensing. I know this has been in the security area. They have made, an, uh, they've intentionally avoided uh, encumbered technologies. That's been the choice of that group, of the groups doing that work. In um, a particular working group, if there's an IPR disclosure, the group can decide whether or not it wants to proceed um, with the technology, with the draft, with, um, uh, it, based on that IPR disclosure. Um, it's a working group consensus process. It's not about the validity of the, or the applicability or the correctness or necessarily even all the details. Certainly it's helpful for people to form their opinions based on what the details are. Um, but in terms of our process, we're not gonna discuss those details. We'll only discuss whether there's consensus on a document, on moving a document forward. So, so I think part of your point, Jeff, is that it's impossible to engineer a solution around IPR that you can't see. Exactly. Um, so one of the influencing factors that individual participants may consider when deciding whether or not to engineer around a solution is what the licensing terms are. Now, for clarity, I am not seeking to influence the way that companies license their IPR. However, no, However, if they license, if the license that comes along with a piece of IPR that you can't see says, if you implement this, we will come and take your firstborn, then it's likely that people are going to try to engineer around it. Whereas if the license says, hey, you know what, we've got IPR, but you can have it for nothing, then people are probably not going to try to engineer around it. So that, that comes into the mix when looking at this, but we still have that problem. If somebody says, discloses, I've got IPR here, but I'm not telling you what it is, it's then a it's a problem. Yeah, life is a problem. So before we run off stage, just a reminder, uh, you just have two people talking about their personal opinions here. Um, talk to your company uh, attorneys, Read the documents for yourselves. Uh, and if you have questions and want to hear from the IETF's attorney, uh, that's, that'll happen in Singapore. But right now, you've just heard from two individuals, not anything beyond that. Sue, Even though, e sue him. Sue him. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even though we may wear certain hats in the IETF, these are, we're just two individuals talking our, uh, our personal perspectives. Thank you. And uh, when you consider your legal options, remember that um, I didn't actually say anything. <laughs> you guys agree with me, so good. That's that's a good thing. And uh, my jokes are not protected by any IPR. You may repeat them at any time you want. You like that? Good. Okay. So now um, we're going to go into the exciting world of 
working group updates. And uh, we're going to go to the wiki. Can you say something? Sure. So I noticed that despite my requests, um, Babel hasn't filled itself out yet. Do we have a Babel chair in the room to give their report? Oh, thank you, Russ. Excellent. Now I don't have to ad lib. You don't have to yell at me? Well, I thought it was already filled out. So there you go. That's our coordination. We need a better coordination between Babel. Um, what happened in the working group this week is um, we decided to go offline to talk about unicast hellos. That meeting's happening today. Um, we agreed on a consensus around several changes to the Babel drafts uh, for the BIS, and pretty much that's it. We're moving forward. There was a presentation about beer in Babel, but um, or Babel, but um, we decided to sideline that until we or to think about it more before we call for working group adoption or anything until we see requirements and uh, you know stuff like that. So pretty simple meeting, lots of energy in the room, lots of really cool ideas being floated. So. Um, Bess is next. Uh, neither Martin nor uh, Thomas could be here today. They are here, uh, however. So um, the working group is making progress. Uh, as usual, with the uh, very clear and straightforward EPPM and VPN type documents. Uh, this is one of the type of documents that I would encourage everyone to go read. Um, they're very, very uh, inspiring. Uh, there's work going on, of course, new work uh, in support of MVO3 and uh, Yang models and everything else. You can read the numbers up there. DFD. So since we'd like to get through this quickly, I'd request folks who are the networking group chair for the next alphabetical working groups to start queuing up or being prepared. Thanks. We could make this take longer. So BFD is not meeting this uh, ITF. Uh, the work that we have in progress right now is the multi-point documents are going through working group last call. We've got some feedback on there and we're waiting to hear from uh, an implementer in terms of what their implementation uh, does in terms of matching the spec. We're having some issues with the BFD Yang module in terms of how it interworks with the IGP modules. You know, as uh, the IGP chairs will point out, we've gone back and forth on this a few times. Um, you know, the solution that's uh, currently in both documents is neither of them will actually talk to each other. This actually has to be addressed. And we'll uh, try to get a short virtual interim after the session. We had some fun in the, the MPLS session about the BFD directed uh, you know, feature. This uh, is partially an issue in IPR, partially a matter of whether or not uh, the working group thinks it's a useful feature and uh, potentially a change to 5884. There are also uh, two other drafts uh, for BFD that are being presented in the MPLS session this Friday. Beer. Greg is here, don't worry. I'm here. Can you open up so I can read? You put nothing in there. Not I, there. That's not true. I just <laughs> refreshed it. Well, let me refresh it again. We just had this dialogue. I put this up. That's bizarre. Huh. Uh, all right. <laughs> we have a bunch of uh, drafts that are actually coming out of the last call now. Uh, we have one in the queue, which is the architecture draft. We've got one outstanding discuss on that that I think has been addressed really well by the list and the authors, but uh, whoever's got the name of the discuss hasn't really fed back yet. Um, the other point that's probably going to be launched now from the group is our work towards justifying move from um, experimental to standards. Just following the, the charter information, getting the draft in place, reaching the, you know, the full four bullet points that are from there, and then feedback in the field. I put it up this morning. There, w there was an edit merge that took place when I first did it. Someone else had it, and then I merged it and saw the diffs. I believe that. Merge for 
It was pre-coffee. So, so please remember that um, we're in the middle of the week. So ideally, you maybe put information even before you meet. So some of you may actually have to go and refresh all of this. Right. So yeah, it's okay. Thanks. Daniela Ceccarelli for CCAMP. I'm happy to see that our contribution is the right, right part of the branch, of the merge. So we're meeting twice, as usual. We have a joint young session with other working groups of the routing area, TIS, and PLS, and PC. This time is hosted by TIS. We are meeting on Thursday, afternoon session one, and immediately after with our CCAM dedicated session. Highlights, we still have two design teams, one for microwave, one for transport and BI. The microwave design team is doing pretty well, going faster. Uh, they had the two deliverables, both uh, documents are now working group uh, documents. They also participated to the hackathon and they won as uh, best contribution. Uh, regarding the transport MBI, we have two documents now. We are in the process of adopting them. Young models, we have a, num a huge number of drafts for optical, uh, OTN, uh, IP over WDM, and we recently adopted also uh, the OTN topology and the tunnel models, which are an augmentation of the TIS document, the T topology and the T tunnel model. <laughs> Status, uh, we have one draft in the editor queue. It's been there for a while because we decided to, to put it on hold and uh, um, have a, general, a more generalized work in TIS and make this work depend on that. A lot of liaisons, we write a lot. One of going to the ITUT for uh, Flex Ethernet and uh, three incoming liaisons on Flex Ethernet, OTNT uh, uh, from uh, uh, ITU and BBF. Okay, Pat Thaler, DetNet. Um, so the focus for this meeting is moving forward on the data plane. Um, we uh, think we're converging on pseudo-wire MPLS and IP over 802.1 TSN. We're also uh, looking at the definition of the service parameters and we're talking about the traffic treatment that's required. Um, and uh, we're going to have discussions on security and um, there's also a little demonstration of the DetNet data plane actually providing protection for failover. So there's a cute little Lego robot that is balancing and uh, we show that, um, yep, we can keep from losing the packets and keep the robot uh, balanced without falling over uh, when we take a link down. So that's basically it. I'm IR2S. Uh, we had two sessions this week. Uh, we have two main data models, uh, topology and RIP, uh, RIP has both info model and, and regular model. They're both uh, past working group or working group last call. We are grateful to the Yang doctors who are reviewing uh, and we hope to have this back at the ISG and approved. That's our hope. There are interest in two da new data models, uh, a fabric and a split between data plane and user. We need two editors for two main documents. So our second half of the session was an editing, to which again we are grateful to the new revised data store team that came and uh, gave us lots of suggestions. I am looking for a few uh, uh, editors or authors for the two main documents for the ephemeral data store and for a rest conf uh, thing. If you're interested in working on that, please see me. Um, the second session will merely be an editor session. Uh, I will be there, uh, but we will probably change the location. I'll probably just be at the registration desk looking for an editor. Please uh, contact me. Uh, most of these documents are done, and we think if we just have a long editing session, we can close it off here. Uh, 
Okay, I guess I need to step aside and wait for the ideas buff, and then I'm just going to stand here because I'm IDR. Okay, it looks like uh, the ideas buff chairs are not here. Uh, Tim Lusinski and Brian Heberman are the chairs for that buff, which is going to happen this afternoon, uh, right after lunch at 1.30. Uh, I'm not sure where. So like any other buff, uh, why are we here? We're going to talk about the problem statement, uh, some discussion about what needs to be done, and then uh, this is intended to be a working group forming BOF. So the normal questions are going to be asked. Is the problem statement clear? Is this work that the ATF should do? Who's going to actually do the work? And uh, then we'll see where we go from there. So uh, please go to the ADS BOF this afternoon. Okay, IDR. IDR is Thursday, 9 to 12. Our topics uh, are we still are considering um, trying to respond to operators uh, and make sure we're getting through things. I sat again at the GROW uh, working group and we found we're still not getting through some of the things the operators need. So again, we encourage operators to be there and tell us what we need to do we're trying to get rid of squatting by early allocation or changing allocation. So please come and see the chairs list. We really have things on the list on um, BGPLS. Uh, John's got a really good discussion thread there. If you want to talk about it, John's here, uh, and he'll take care of it. Say, John. Okay. Uh, other things we're going to talk about are flow spec. Our flow spec V1 had, again, operator input. And we believe that the revision that now makes it, uh, clears up any spec uh, problems is ready for working group last call. We have BGB tunnel attributes, uh, route server, uh, uh, BFD interaction to make sure uh, link loss at IXP is taken care of. Um, that should be route uh, leak, not lead perfection. I need more coffee. Uh, and we have new work uh, that's either reviewing uh, grow stuff on uh, congestion or fib or uh, uh, link logical. Come and see the new work and listen. This is a good uh, IDR as we have a little extra time this time, so come and ask questions. Bye. Uh, yeah, so ISI is not on Monday. Oh, big time. Oh, I left that on there. Uh, I guess the biggest item would be that we're discussing combining OSPF and ISIS again. Uh, seems like the last time we did this, ISIS had a lot more sort of separate stuff, and we had a lot more overlap lately with segment routing. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we're looking at that also to get cross-pollination between the two. Uh, so we talked about this in the, in the working group, and it was surprising sort of 50-50 split on whether people wanted to do it or not. There were a lot of opinions. I'm sure that will carry over maybe into the list. In the meantime, the plan is to run an experiment and we're going to try to combine the lists. Um, it's appearing to be harder than we thought it would be. Uh, but yeah, we'll figure something out. So ISIS mail will go to OSPF, OSPF mail will go to ISIS and hopefully not loop. And then we'll run a combined session um, not just a back-to-back -back session so everybody can leave after the first one that doesn't care about the second one. Um, and then we'll see how, how people feel about it and whether it seems like it works or it's a hassle or whatnot. And uh, we can go from there. The other ish, the other things I guess of note are we have two new RFCs, um, the auto configuration and then the BIS update to multi-topology. And also, um, we have something, uh, the L2 bundles is about to go RFC, it's in this rep. L2 TPEXT, I don't see anybody here. Um, they're not meeting, um, they had one new RFC um, and that was on their IPv6 tunnel. Okay, list met on Monday at 1.30. We've had one RFC recently published. Very many thanks to our ADs and to the RFC editor and to IANA because we ran into a little 
code point allocation problem and everybody worked together to solve it, so that was great. We've got one document under final IESG review, one in working group last call, bunch of things we've adopted for interesting work. The real key is those two main documents right there, 6830 BIS and 6833 BIS. Both are in good shape, are progressing. Our goal is to get those to propose standard and we are hoping to hand those up soon. I don't know what soon means yet, per Adrian's screed somewhere, but we're trying, that's the thing that is currently the high priority for the working group, and so we're gonna do that. There's some individual drafts, there have been some individual drafts that requested uh, adoption and not enough people spoke up, and so we said, well, okay, there's still individual drafts. Manet, I don't see Justin or Stan here. Uh, Manet didn't meet this time. Uh, I do have to say that the same as there are IPR uh, possible sanctions for not disclosing, there are possible sanctions for not filling out the wiki. And uh, one of them that Adrian mentioned as uh, effective is uh, naming and shaming. So I'm officially publicly shaming Justin and Stan for not filling out their, um, their status here. Um, at least in the other cases where the status was filled, the chair was able to stand up. Here, nothing. Uh, double shame to them. So in any case, Manet did not meet. There's a steady progress on DLAP extensions um, that have been, I think, making good progress in the, in the mailing list. Um, I don't know if you guys are standing there because you have to say something about Manet or not. Uh, yeah, uh, um, both chairs, this is Lou Berger or Rick Taylor, we're going to say the same thing. Uh, both, neither chair is here, but we're both here working on some other things, and so we're talking, hopefully, about DLAP extensions. Yeah. So. Sure. so there's stuff going on in this, this meeting, even though the chairs are not holding a session. So it's great that work is making progress. That's what is expected. Still, third uh, round of public shaming for uh, not filling up. Radio, okay, so I'm Lou Anderson speaking for MPLS. Um, we have had a couple of things that has been kind of rocking things a bit. George couldn't travel and our secretary couldn't travel this time. Uh, George because uh, of financing, I think, and Tarek because of weather. It was raining in Toronto. Um, so we had one session yesterday, uh, Nick and I think we actually could ma made it through that session uh, acceptable level. Uh, we have a new session on Friday, we can just continue on the agenda. Uh, and on Thursday we have the joint session on Jang models. Um, so in that first session we had, we discussed one document, and I didn't want to be particular, but Jeff already mentioned that it's a BFP directed document. Uh, we discussed the IPR process, and I think we are closing on that one, and we have technical comments on the document that we haven't closed yet. Uh, we also have quite a bit of new work coming in, uh, not like it was like five years ago, but uh, it's actually picking up coming, new DAOs coming in in pretty good shapes. We have three new hour seasons last time, and interestingly enough, we have uh, two drafts that are very interesting for the MPLS working group coming out of PALS. Um, and if we look at the list, we have about 20 documents updated since, since Chicago. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Matthew Bocci for MVO3. So we're meeting this afternoon at 3.20. Um, we've made quite a lot of progress now on data plane encapsulation. So the working group has kind of uh, selected Draft Geneve um, for a standards track solution within the working group. Um, at the last ITF, we held an experiment and held some round tables, discussions uh, on control plane security and data plane related work. 
And the security work, certainly um, security roundtable was quite productive and has um, resulted in some new drafts in the working group that we are discussing this afternoon um, around requirements and architecture and solutions for security with Draft Geneve. Um, we also, another thing of note is that we tried to adopt a couple of drafts that were an output of the routing working group overlay OEM design team. And um, there was quite a lot of pushback in the working group to adopting these, um, mostly regarding the desirability of a common header across um, different encapsulations and whether or not this is really necessary. Um, we're currently trying to resolve this issue in, in the working group. So just a quick status update, um, one new RFC since the last ITF use cases for DC VPNs and the MVO3 multicast framework is currently with Leo. Yeah. AC Lindham, we met yesterday, we had a nice intimate meeting uh, adjacent to MPLS. Uh, Chris already uh, covered the fact that we're going to have a truly joint meeting in Singapore as an experiment with uh, the like set, like uh, topics interleaved. For instance, if we have segment routing or uh, attributes, we talked about t attribute uh, reuse or things like that. We talk about both protocols back to back. In terms of OSPF specific highlights, the extended Attributes for OSPF v3, we have, we have two implementations. We're gonna, we're gonna proceed toward uh, publication on that and that's really a great milestone because then we'll get to a truly uh, TLV based protocol, not only for the, uh, the, the LSAs we've added in uh, recent years, but the base LSAs. The, T attribute, we've been discussing this for a long time. We have a meeting among, to, to talk about how we uh, get consensus forward. Let's see, it's tomorrow. Uh, that's an ongoing discussion. And we didn't have any new RFCs, but uh, I think the segment routing draft is ready for AD review again, and the tunnel end cap draft is also ready for AD review again. Andy Malice for PALS. Um, we, we, we've actually had some work of interest come up lately. There's been um, some problems observed in the field with Ethernet pseudowires as a result of some implementations or operators not using the control word on, uh, on Ethernet pseudowires with the result that some MAC addresses in the embedded Ethernet frames are being um, um, looked at by the router and, and being identified incorrectly as IPv4 or IPv6 with the result that ECMP is being applied to Ethernet flows, uh, which is the wrong thing to do. So we're working on a draft to make sure that people are aware that you really do need to be using the, the, the control word for Ethernet pseudowires. Um, and the, the Two co-chairs of the working group are the co-authors in this draft, so Matthew Bocci has agreed to um, be the shepherd for this draft and, and, and to run the process. Um, other than that, um, we had one other thing come up in, in our meeting on Monday um, that was a proposal for a pseudo-wire Yang data model. However, um, I have to thank the BEST working group because the the best working group has been very happy to work on a unified um, Yang data model for both L2 VPN and pseudowires. So we um, spoke to the um, authors of this proposal and tell them to, to basically fold in their work with the ongoing work in BEST so we don't have multiple solutions going on for the same problem. Um, other than that, we've been extremely prolific and, and working towards shutting down. Um, since November 2015, the last year and three quarters, we've published 14 RFCs. We have four more that are coming out soon. Um, and right now we have no other working group drafts, but, but, the, but the one on Ethernet pseudowires uh, will be the last one, we think. And after that, we'll be talking to Deborah about the future of the working group.
Julien Maric, Past Computation Element Working Group. We had a meeting yesterday evening, colliding a bit with the past departure for the social. Uh, anyway, it was uh, an interesting meeting. One of the major events related to the PC Working Group is the change of secretary. Uh, Daniel King has stepped down, so we thank him for the work. And Ralph Doddy has agreed to be our new secretary, so thank to him too. Uh, main topic discussed yesterday, the use of the PC as a central controller, uh, some work related to the stateful PC extensions and the hierarchical um, ways of using the, the PC, some optical specific extensions, and we may also mention the disagreement that ended the session yesterday that may require some talk with Deborah, who's already aware of the the topic there. Uh, from the administrative perspective, we have we haven't published any RFC since the previous meeting, but we really think we will have a bunch of them before the next IETF because we have four in the RFC editor queue, three with the AEG, and some other coming up in the near future. So we hope that considering dependency between uh, a set of the documents there, they will be released soon on published as RFCs. Thanks. So uh, protocols for IP multicast are still alive and well, for better or for worse. We met yesterday morning with um, Mbone D Ops group back to back. We've done that for several ITFs now and it's worked quite well. I foresee us continuing to do that. Um, on the ops side, a lot of interesting use cases for multicast and discussions about deprecating ASM and Wi Fi multicast. And on the protocol side, PIM, um, a lot of progress happening on Yang. Uh, we have public uh, publication requested for uh, both PIM and uh, IGMP MLD um, Yang drafts. There may need to be some update with uh, new Yang config formats happening, but um, they are progressing. A uh, couple uh, new uh, documents um, that are progressing. Uh, Stig presented a, a draft that uh, appeared to be well received with regards to um, accessing an IPv4 prefix over an IPv6 next hop. And when there's multiple RPF neighbors, that are V4 neighbors, how do you choose? Um, so that's it, it's um, that's interesting to work. Um, so otherwise, we plan to uh, meet again in Singapore. Thank you. Hi, for all. We are going to meet tomorrow in the afternoon. And then we have a working group last call and document, like a use case for use of a ripple info. Uh, where we had uh, some updates to RFC 6553 and 6550, so we want to the working group to decide if they are here or not. And then uh, we are working in the working group topics that we have recharted, and uh, we have the CISLAW routing header finished, that is the RFC 8138. Uh, okay, so the topics that we recharted and we are working currently is like constraint multicast, uh, source routing multicast for Ripple, uh, DAO projection, DAO modifications, ODB Ripple. They're going to be presented tomorrow and we are, no, uh, we are not going to present like this modification and their model for MPL this time. Uh, um, additionally, we are going to have a related internet draft presented tomorrow as well. It's about the parent selection. Okay, thank you. Uh, routing, we are meeting twice. So ATF uh, highlights good progress in young models. Uh, the presentation routing in data center progressing on segment routing fast convergence. There's going to be presentation VPN plus, which has to do with slicing and some other stuff. So we also have short presentations and informational draft Yari and myself put together to talk about systematic approach to latency which definitely affects routing uh, status. We've got one new RFC, young model for keychain, uh, two drafts 
are with ASG. We are going through working group last call on young routing types. And there are a few more drafts that are in process. SFC met on Monday. Uh, the important work is we're trying to get the NSH document completed. We are this close. Of course, we keep being this close. But I think we have a draft 15, which addresses all of the comments the working group members made either on the list or in the meeting. So we hope to be able to hand that off. I've, Jim and I have to do our reviews and then I've got a shepherd write up for the AD as soon as that's done. A lot of discussion on OAM, lots of different things people want to do with OAM, different approaches to OAM. We're trying to get the framework so that we can say, okay, all of the OAM solutions have to do this much the same, and then you can do your own thing for what you want to do for the problem you want to solve so we can get clarity. We're trying to move that work forward. There's some work on uh, the MD types for how we carry metadata. Work is basically making good progress. Cider. So Sandy is not here. She uh, didn't travel. Chris is here. So I'm going to have to shame again uh, Sandy and Chris for not uh, filling this out. Uh, Cider didn't meet this week. So, uh, so actually, Alvaro, this is Chris Bowers here. You might want to check the revisions because I, I went and looked at the revisions on the wiki. For example, Greg did in fact post something on beer in version 31. So you might before shaming, I just want to, you know, save you from that shame of false shaming. Uh, you might want to check the, uh, the history there. I'm not saying that this is a case, but um, could, could be there. So it's because Greg's are down there in 30 and 31. I, I just want to point out. Right. So Greg is there. Uh, so, but for the record, we didn't actually shame Greg. I, I, I understand. I understand. I just wanted to avoid any unnecessary shaming. Okay. So, after review of the history, I'm going to uh, renew my shaming of Chris, not Chris Bowers, Chris Morrow, just you know, so that we're clear, and uh, Sandy, uh, the chair, so the cider working group. Um, Cider, as I was saying, didn't meet this time, um, mostly because, as you may remember from a couple of ATFs ago, we pretty much finished the work. Um, we opened a new working group that has been meeting for the last two ATFs, where Chris is also the chair, uh, called Cider Ops in the Ops area, where we're now discussing, of course, operational uh, work, etc. Cider still has one um, draft in the working group that should be really close or already in working group last call. Once that goes through the process, we are gonna close the working group. Uh, right now we have about eight or 10 documents in Auth48. Uh, the RC editor has been doing an incredible job in getting everyone synced and, and we hope to, in the next few weeks, hopefully, or maybe a couple of months, publish everything as R6. Spring. So Spring is not meeting this week. Um, in terms of highlights, we have um, the Spring Conflict Resolution, which is under working group last call, which is good because it has been a long discussion in two working groups, starting in ISIS and moving to Spring. So we're progressing. Um, as of today, we have eight uh, big documents in uh, ISG ends. And as of next steps, so we still have a few ones to progress. Um, we have started uh, initiating a discussion on possible uh, recharter. Um, we may adopt uh, a few or a couple of one uh, in the meantime. In terms of status, uh, we have just then sent to ISG uh, the LDP interrupt draft. So it's part of the eight one. And as part of the review of the OAM use case, we've got a command that it's more than the use case. And it may be uh, to start track, so we, we, we may have to discuss that. And finally, a big thanks to, to Alvaro, which has uh, 
a big set of large documents to, to handle, so thank you. Paul and Biram Fatis. Uh, we met for our regular session uh, yesterday morning. Uh, we have what is now uh, like this customary joint young session coming up uh, tomorrow afternoon. In terms of highlights, uh, the modeling work that's being done uh, has reached a, uh, an acceptable level of maturity. The T topology model is NMDA compliant now, and as per the others, it's last call ready. Uh, the T and RSCP models are not NMDA compliant, but uh, there are significant portions of the models which are uh, uh, sufficiently baked. Uh, in terms of ACTN, uh, the framework and requirements documents are uh, almost ready for last call. Uh, there's a request from the chairs to pull in some uh, text from an individual draft to either one or both of these documents. Uh, apart from that, uh, these are sufficiently cooked. Uh, there are also a few other documents under the ACTN umbrella which are uh, uh, progressing quite well and uh, getting ready for adoption. Uh, we also adopted uh, some new work. Uh, there's this draft that talks about uh, SR LSPs and RSVP LSPs coexistence uh, that got adopted recently. Uh, in terms of document status, we have one new RFC, the six for which we put in publication request in recent weeks, and there are two new adoptions. And I'm glad to be last. Um, Trill. Trill is commuting a lot of existing work. Uh, we have about 17 drafts going to working group last call. Uh, we know this because, uh, prior to the hiatus, um, we know this because uh, we've been gratefully accepting the revision that the that the uh, ADs did to the routing directorate. We Trill had a lot of drafts uh, that uh, were sitting waiting for routing directorate. Uh, review. There are people who have been very good to review things for us. Thanks. Uh, we have nice engineering solutions, by the way. If you're in VO3, you should really look at some of the stuff that's going through at the end. Uh, at least you can learn from what, what we've gained. We have areas of work that are being convened, completed in these 17 drafts for directory service, uh, multi-topology, multi-level security ECN. Um, we are having this time very focused drafts on things which uh, these reviews uncovered. For example, Trill over IP, we finally got a really terrific cool review from Magnus Westerland, and he pointed out a whole bunch of things. Um, previously, we'd gotten a really good review from Alvaro on and the int director on ARP optimization and we're just talking about these things and some things with fine green labbing. Uh, we're presenting uh, one or two last pieces of new work that uh, will are in the middle of adoption prior to our hiatus. Uh, so, and then this is one of the drafts. So if you are one of the people in routing who's asked to review all these drafts, know that ahead of time we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you to everyone uh, who we did not shame. Um, it's great to thank you for closing with uh, thanking the director. So we're going to go, John is going to present a uh, quick report on the routing director. Uh, we know that many of you are part of that, so thank you for that work. Um, one of the reasons that I like this, it's not just that it is you know, so exciting uh, for everyone, but also because it, it informs right, what people are doing the work of the Rodden Directorate. Um, some things that popped out at me, just because I'm thinking about that, is there were a couple of, uh, there's a couple of work that, for example, could be leveraged. We could leverage other people. Uh, reviews is not only, that we talked about at the beginning, but reviews is not only the work of the Rodden Directorate. It's the work of everyone. And when we can leverage, say, other working groups, for example, there was uh, some architecture work, I think, on multicast architecture for NBO3 or something like that. Uh, PIM is there, right? There's a bunch of multicast people in PIM. Uh, there's some work that I saw in the role report around multicast. Well, you know, we don't have to adopt the work anywhere, but we could you know, send it for a review. Um, there's this work that was called just now on uh, SR and RSVP coexistence. There's something similar in Spring for um, uh, SR and LDP uh, interoperability. So, you know, there's some. Uh, synergy, right, not overlap necessarily, but some synergy between the working groups. And it's good that we take advantage, not just of the central review opportunities that we have, 
but of each other. Uh, we already have expertise in, in the, the area or elsewhere in the ITF uh, to take advantage of that. So with that, uh, John, please, uh, he's going to do a quick um, review. Let me get my slides in order. Okay, so just a quick report from the, the routing directorate um, covering the last four months. And um, this is on behalf of myself and Amy, who's the other coordinator for the routing directorate. Thanks for that, Thanks. Um, so just a reminder of the role of the routing directorate is um, a panel of routing area experts, and they're appointed by the ADs. We currently have 46 people on this panel. Um, and their job is um, on the panel to provide expert reviews of drafts, um, which can either be at IATF last call, um, either from inside the routing area or from outside the routing area, um, or um, before we get to the IATF last call, while the documents are still in the working groups, we, the, the director can do early reviews on those documents. So if uh, chairs want uh, a sort of external pair of eyes to come in and have a look at a document to see, you know, um, just to get a second opinion on it or, you know, just to do some sort of quality check, then the, the directorate do that too. Um, we tend to assign our reviews across the directorate using round robins. So if you're on the directorate, it means you could end up with some random draft to review. Um, you don't need to be a deep expert in that area of technology. In fact, it's usually better if you're not because then you can sort of take a higher level view and look for, for, for wider issues, maybe check for readability or things that are not explained, which a working group will not necessarily see, um, but which become really important once you get the, uh, the draft further along the, the process to the IESG. Um, but we will occasionally handpick reviewers, so if, if the chair needs a particular expertise to, to review a draft, then we can do that too. Okay, uh, more information on the wiki. Uh, the statistics, uh, just to show you what the directorate has done uh, this last ITF period, uh, we've reviewed 32 drafts. They're about 50-50 split between IETF last call reviews and working group reviews, uh, maybe a few more of the IETF last call. Um, the, the way the drafts we've reviewed break, break down by, by area, uh, sorry, by working group, kind of changes each time. So there's, you know, this time we had lots from routing working group um, and quite a few from T's, but that's that's just sort of a kind of comes and goes as, as uh, drafts come through the cycle. Uh, in terms of results, 3% um, of drafts we reviewed were not ready. I think that's just one of the 32. Um, uh, the rest of the time, the directorate were finding nits in 21%, um, finding issues, which are you know problems to discuss, but not necessarily blocking problems in 58% of the drafts we reviewed, um, and 20. 21% uh, have nits, uh, which are sort of editorial things. So, I mean, the 58% figure is key. The directorate does find real issues uh, in post document quality. It's really worth having your, your drafts reviewed in the directorate. Meantime, to review a draft by the director is about 15 days. And I think that's just a, a factor of the fact that most chairs ask for a, a, a 14 day deadline on the, on the review, and uh, people are pretty good at sticking to deadlines. Um, and finally, just a big thank you to everyone who works in the directorate and, and does these reviews because, you know, it's, it's a non-trivial exercise. It takes time and we're very grateful for your efforts. Adrian. Uh, Adrian Farrell, so thank you right back at you um, for administrating this. Um, I'd like the ADs to comment on that 58% because clearly you're right that having the directorate find the 58% is really good, but clearly you're wrong that 58% of documents get this far with issues, is not that, because that's not good. <laughs> I, I agree, that's not good. Um, now, one thing I want to point out is that maybe roughly half um, are early reviews, right, which are reviews that the chairs request uh, earlier in the process. Uh, maybe before we can do a call or at some point. Now, I think, uh, and I don't know this is the point that you're trying to make, but the point that I want to make is that we shouldn't, 
expect external of the working group reviews to find the 60% of the issues, right? Because the 58% that has issues that maybe we need to, we should have resolved in the working group before. And uh, obviously more stressing is that 3% that is um, not ready. Now, not all of these drafts are inside the routing area. Uh, once in a while, when there is ITF last call of documents that are related to the routing area, we ask for a review of those as well. Uh, for example, recently we went through the exercise of making the APV6 specifications uh, internet standards, and so we asked the director to review those documents because we thought you know, they're related, strongly related to, to the routing area. So some of these documents, and, and I don't know if you have a breakdown of that or not, but some of them um, that may have had issues or not ready could have been those. In any case, the important thing, the, the important point that I want to make is that uh, this is one of the reasons why I have said a couple of times today that it is important that we review, re-review, that we all contribute to the work in the working group. I see too many plus ones and too many just yeses do you support? Yes, 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 uh, in the working groups. And uh, we should be working. Uh, just because you trust me and you think I do a good job doesn't mean that I didn't screw up my draft. And uh, in my personal case, I mostly do. So please review uh, review the work. And uh, even though the program director is doing a great job, um, and again, we want to thank everyone for that, uh, it is important that um, we do the reviews inside the working group as well. So just to add to that, maybe next time I'll try and do two pie charts showing early reviews and last call reviews, because I think maybe you know the combining them might lead you to think that more of the last call reviews have quality issues than, than they really did. Hello, Anderson. I was actually going to comment on the yes and plus ones, but I don't want to do that. I want to say something totally different. I don't know about the rest of you, but I need to state how much I actually appreciate the improvement of the work in the uh, routing area directorate over the last year and with the people get, getting in and actually taking it seriously. And we know actually, now we're actually doing good reviews. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, so I was just going to say, you already picked up on the two charts, but uh, yeah. Alvaro mentioned that we also do reviews of outside. So if we want to measure ourselves, also maybe separate out non-routing. It's it's sort of there, the, it's, it's hard to read, but uh, non-area is the top line on the right-hand chart. We, we did two out of 32. Yeah, just for that, oh, well, yeah. just for that 58% thing, though. Right. <laughs> it's not statistically significant this time, but right. we, yeah, over a longer period, yeah, maybe. And just come back. Um, I, I think it's Avar, so we should really try all to, to try to review the documents earlier in the process. Um, but I also, I don't see anything wrong with um, uh, the directorate reviewer giving um, a mark that it's not, you know, ready, has issues, because I don't see these as failing grades. I, th I see this as just trying to improve. Um, it's no different than if do an ISG uh, review if you get a discuss on your document. Don't take it that you failed or something. It's it's everything is meant just to improve, and um, so there's nothing wrong. So we don't want that the directorate now starts giving A plus pluses to everybody <laughs> when actually just just to make this chart look good. Yeah, I mean the goal is the whole point of having the reviews is constructive criticism and getting them better, but. I also want to echo Alvaro's point. The responsibility for producing quality documents out of the working groups is not the directorates, or it's not the area directors, it's everybody's. And one of the aspects of going to a round robin is that you're now dependent on, um, I mean, obviously we all have expertise, but I don't have expertise in everything. And so, you know, it's an unfair burden on the area directors and on the directorate to expect them to be able to do all of the detailed technical quality review that needs to be coming from the working groups. And I can tell you that 
I think our experience of issues when we do AD reviews, which is frequently after the routing directorate, or at the same time, is um, probably on the well higher than 50%. So we'd really like to see better work and more reviews. Thank you. microphone okay so now we are on to uh, open mic anything you want to discuss please get up to the mic John John Scudder <clears throat> um, you people who are awake through the whole lightning round I'm sure I noticed Sue talking about uh, in the IDR portion about um, code point squatting, blah, blah, blah. Um, I had considered asking you for some time during this meeting for, you know, it, it's one of these boring but important topics, and I, I didn't get around to it or preparing any materials, but I'd like to suggest that um, either at a, a um, you know, one of our periodic chairs. Uh, virtual meetings or something, uh, it might be a worthwhile topic to talk about um, code point allocation. And in particular, I've been surprised by the number of people, especially IETF old timers, who you might say don't understand or you might say have different opinions about how the different uh, IANA allocation policies actually work. And um, I'm concerned that we're not making enough use of IANA to do work for us and instead we're trying to do the work ourselves and we're not as good at it as they are. Uh, sure, please remind us to uh, revisit that topic at some of the you know, future um, chair chats. Um, I don't know if it was the last ITF or the ITF before, uh, Jeff did a presentation on uh, considerations around allocation and squatting and early use and other things. Um, I think he did it here. So um, we'll, we'll please look up the, the materials. And I think, I know, John, you're talking about other, you know, further beyond that. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, whatever the RFC was for IANA considerations was just BIST. And uh, it is now uh, some other RFC number uh, in the 8,000 series. Um, most of the work that they did there, they tried to clarify some of the uh, procedures and allocation policies and, and other things. Um, it might be a good idea to um, to also talk about that, or, or to get maybe Ayana or someone to give us a um, a refresher or or an overview of the changes and, and things along those lines. Yeah, I think that would be great. I, in particular, um, yeah, I remember Jeff's talk well. Um, but in particular, I'm suggesting what, what you said, which is to focus on the IANA part of it, which I think a lot of us think we know what's in there until we go and read it, and then we're like, oh, actually, it says something different. Rick Taylor, I'm just trying to cover a topic that was missed out because the MANA uh, entry in the wiki was missing. Um, since the last meeting, we've managed to get RFC 8175 out, which is DLEP. Um, which I think has applicability outside of MANA. Um, if you have interest in BFD or you're working in a core routing protocol, OSPF, ISIS, DLEP is probably of interest to you when you start to get beyond the fixed network. So can I just ask people to have a look at it, see whether it's applicable to some of the corner cases you have with your core working group work. I think this is following on from Alvaro's comment about some of the working groups are doing and producing work that has much wider applicability than just their, their original niche. So 8175 is worth a look. Thanks, Rick, for, for that and for the reminder. Um, Justin and uh, Stan um, did a presentation maybe two or three ATFs ago about the work that had been going on in Monet, including including DLAP. Uh, the fact that it could be applicable to other things was the last. Uh, there was Actually, a lot of discussion in the ASG about that. Um, please go find those slides. 
Um, the other thing that we had started a discussion after that presentation with some of the other working group chairs, for example, Roll, about the fact that there is you know, usability and then things that we can share. Um, just because we're doing mechanisms that we seem to be targeting at mobile you know, ad hoc environments or IoT environments, that doesn't mean that those aren't applicable to core networks or vice versa, right? Some of the uh, methodology and enhancements that we're doing to core networks could be applicable in other places. Um, last Saturday, just to tell you a story because we have time, we spent uh, seven hours, and I'm not gonna go through the whole seven hours, we spent seven hours in a coordination meeting with the IEEE, and one of the topics that we talked about was around uh, multicast and wireless environments. And as we were discussing, you know, one of the things was uh, well, we're not trying to do things like multicast and PIM, and it doesn't work over 211 really well. Um, but during the discussion, uh, we found out of some work that had been going on in uh, six low, for example, you know, extending the six low pan neighbor discovery mechanisms that could apply or could solve some of the problems. Now, in general, we maybe I don't know what people are thinking about that, but, but we see IoT enhancements, and maybe we don't think they they apply to other things. I'm not saying those drafts are the solution to every problem uh, with multicasting wireless networks, but it is something that we need to consider. Uh, the more that we cross uh, pollinate and that we talk to each other and that we reuse solutions, uh, I think probably the, the better, when, when we can, of course. So anyone else? One of the things that we keep um, thinking about ourselves and that we brought up uh, for a very short discussion at the uh, routing director and routing chairs meeting on Monday is uh, where are we going? What's the future of the routing area or routing in general? Uh, what are the new things that, that we see? Many of the working groups, as you saw, are making progress. Most of the work groups, all of the work groups are making progress, some progress, you know, faster or slower. Um, some of them we consider that could be to the point where we could even close some of the working groups uh, at some point in the relatively short future. Uh, so what happens next? Are we ready for the next revolution of whatever it is? Is there work that we should be looking in the IETF, specifically in the routing area, to do? Uh, and I'm sure the answer is yes. Uh, more importantly, how do we attract that work to come to the ITF? Is there work that we're not looking at because it may be too researchy, because it may be for routers that are too big or too small or move too fast or too slow? Um, so what we want to, um, we don't know the answers to any of those questions, of course, uh, but we want to hear from you and, and more importantly, we want to ask you to please work towards that as well. In other words, don't just tell us, oh, there's a new hot technology you should bring into the ITF. But, yeah, help us do that as well. Uh, we are only three. You are a lot more than three. And uh, we can, again, the responsibility is the, the, the responsibility of everyone. So if anyone has opinions, thoughts, flames are also valid, uh, please stand up talk about them, send us email later, talk amongst yourselves, write something down. Any other option? You Okay, thank you, Rick. Rick Taylor again. Um, I'm the chair of Delay Tolerant Networking, which is in transport. Um, currently, we're not chartered to do routing because that would probably be a routing area task, but we're we're out of the IRTF, we're now into the IETF, and we're trying to standardize how do you push packets and data around in deeply disrupted and heavily delayed networks. So it's email 2.0 done properly. So at a certain point, we're going to have to solve these routing problems. And we're kind of transport focused, and I'd love to see more guys with the deep routing expertise who are sat in this room or sat in this room's working groups to come and help us solve these problems. Again, they're not charter items yet, but at a certain point, we're going to finish our current set of documents and we're going to read charter and routing is going to be there. So we, we'd like to kind of engage with you guys sooner rather than later. 
can I suggest, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, can I suggest talking to Chris Bowers and Jeff Tenser, the chairs for RTGWG? This sounds like it would be a really excellent discussion for that working group to bring in and educate folks on what that problem space is, so at least people start thinking about it, know to pay attention. Sure. I mean, my transport AD may, might tell me off because we're not chartered to do that work yet, but it's coming. <laughs> so RTGWG is chartered to do discuss new work where we're not sure where it belongs yet. So it seems like a really perfect fit. Perfect. So that, that reminded me of something else. There's this other working group called uh, IP Wave, uh, which is called Vehicle to Vehicle Communication or something like that. And uh, they have been working right now on just running IP over uh, 802.11 OCP, yes. Um, during the original charter discussion, they had routing items in there. Not only because right now they're working on how do we connect the car to the infrastructure pretty much and how do we run IP over that layer two uh, piece. Uh, but in the future, you want to probably communicate between the cars or between the car and someone else and you are gonna need some type of routing stuff in there. Uh, so the working group, that working group is not chartered to do that. But we also know that at some point they, the, the need for the work will happen. Um, most likely, we might not charter that working group to do that, but we will need a place to discuss and do it. So if you have time, go to the TN, go to IP Wave, start looking at those uh, problems because they could come uh, to the routing area as well. So it's kind of personal view. So we know that proximity of our cloud placement stuff is coming to us. Uh, VM containers getting out of data center being placed somewhere else. And it's important to know how do we get the cost of getting there? How do we do this in loop free manner and you know, regular routing stuff? So there's some very early stuff in TS, but it, it will affect a lot of us and it's coming. So it's quite interesting work. Fortunately, unfortunately, we need to work with Etsy on this because those are the ones who define how orchestration layer works. But it's interesting work. I think we should take it. Uh, just another reminder uh, to what Ali already said. Uh, the Routing Area Working Group is chartered to take on any uh, discussion of potential future work. Uh, in the charter, um, the main part of the charter actually talks about how the Routing Area Working Group can serve as a mini BOF type place, right? Where we can go discuss things that maybe it's not mature enough for an actual BOF. Um, the other things that the IESG, for example, has been making statements over the last few years has been around um, that we can accelerate work. You know, we don't need to go to two BOFs and one non working group, non working group forming one and then something else and then whatever and then figure out a bunch of other documents before we can actually start work. Uh, if work is well defined, well understood, and more importantly, uh, not only something that is interesting for the ATF, but something that people are going to actually work on, uh, then we can see you about doing something about it. Um, if it's my idea as much as it would be a great idea, but it's only me who's interested in it, then it's probably not something that we're going to want to work on. So, uh, you know, part of this is also socializing the potential work that we would want to do so that we get some, um, some support behind us and some, you know, people who want to actually uh, write and, again, review documents. Any other thoughts, ideas? Then I guess we're going to leave you the uh, remaining uh, 45 minutes to go brainstorm this topic and uh, talk among yourselves. Uh, in case you need the coffee, there's a little coffee place across the street as well. And just a reminder, we only have one boss this time, but you know, we really, really are open and interested in bringing in new work and other communities, and we need your help to do that. Thank you. You can go. Or you can sit here. That doesn't matter to me.
Unfortunately, that bop was cross scheduled against Yang. I, I haven't sent email. I, I think I can make sure. I didn't look at the list. Is everybody coming? I honestly invited know. everyone. Well, it's probably good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. um, I was sleeping. I've not been feeling good. I don't know. I've been sleeping weird. And now I'm sleeping. It's not bad. I mean, like, it's just I'm sleeping on. Yeah. Like, 